up on Tech News Today, Sony's 4K TV, the true sad story of OnLive, Google Plus gets businessy, and a brand new Galaxy Note. All that more coming up with a spin. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, August 29th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high-quality website or blog, plus more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs with automatic device scaling. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT8. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, put them in some context for you, and we're starting off with the top 10 stories of the day in the news views. The FBI has arrested Rinaldo Rivera on charges relating to Sony's computer breach, which took place last year. The Tempe, Arizona-based Rivera is being charged with conspiracy and unauthorized impairment of a protected computer. Rivera allegedly worked with Cody Kretzinger, who pleaded guilty to hacking charges in April, and both of them have been connected to LulzSec. Now that a jury has ordered Samsung to pay over $1 million to Apple, Judge Lucy Coe has pushed back a September date to discuss any new injunctions Apple would be seeking against products uh, that Samsung makes to December 6th. Coe says that after considering the breadth of Apple's recent injunction request and the additional post-trial motions that the parties have already filed and will file, it makes sense to put the injunction discussion and the post-trial judgment requests on the same schedule. Say hello to my little friend. I Hi. call it TiVo Stream. Well, oh. So does TiVo, because it's theirs. <laughs> TiVo introduced a new $130 box that allows for TiVo Premier users to stream and download your recorded content to a number of iOS devices. An Android app is currently under development. The stream also allows you to look through the channel guide and watch live content. The TiVo Stream will be available September 6th online at TiVo.com. Sony let loose with a cavalcade of announcements at the IFA conference in Berlin, including their first 4K TV, an 84-inch Bravia, coming before the end of the year. Sony also unveiled three new Xperia Android phones and a new Android Xperia Tablet S. On the Windows side, the Vio, Vio Duo 11 is a hybrid tablet, and the Vio Tap 20 is a collapsible all-in-one. The Sony NEX 5R is a mirrorless camera with Wi-Fi, and they also unveiled the Action Cam, a new wearable Wi-Fi camera, kind of like a GoPro. Apple wants your online shopping experience to be closer to your in-store experience. Pocket Lint reports that the company has launched an online service that will allow customers looking to buy products to chat or hold a call with an Apple Store specialist discussing detailed specs on devices. If the customer goes ahead with a purchase, the specialist will set up the product much like they do in-store. The service is only available, at least right now, to customers in the UK, Brazil, Germany, and España. Let's look into the future. Leaked Intel documents show that the company is working on its next generation Atom platform, codenamed BayTrail. BayTrail will use the Valley View system on a chip, which uses a 22 nanometer process, and will have desktop and mobile variants. Now, the CPU on Valley View allows for out of order execution. So instead of queuing up orders like previous generation Atoms, the CPU will process orders as soon as resources are available. That means a lot of speed, but usually at the cost of power. However, Intel already solved that power problem with Ivory Bridge, and that tech is going to help out Baytrail. Oh, and by the way, it has an improved GPU that can decode a 1080p stream at 60 frames per second. So, super. More chip news at the Hot Chips Conference. AMD CTO Mark Papermaster announced more details to the Steamroller Core, meant to boost its per-clock throughput and power efficiency. Additionally, AMD is getting rid of the single shared fetch and decode hardware in favor of dual cores that double the amount of instructions it can handle. The chips will be built at Global Foundry's 28 nanometer line and are hoped to be out some point next year. ISIS, a mobile payment joint venture backed by AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, which will let you pay for in-store items with your mobile phone, is set to debut in September after quite a few months of delays. Verifun, which makes the payment terminals that's working on the project, is preparing for Salt Lake City uh, and Austin, Texas launches next month, says CEO Doug 
Bergeron. Last year, ISIS actually tweaked its strategy, opting to use credit card companies to handle the transactions rather than the carriers themselves. And it's taken a little bit of time to make sure that the payments can be secure. Logitech UE, which stands for Ultimate Ears, that's a company they bought back in 2008, have added seven new audio products to their line. Two mobile Bluetooth speakers, three new headphones with memory foam cushions, a noise-isolating in-ear earphone with four armature speakers in each earpiece, and the next evolution of the squeeze box radio powered by Logitech UE's new mobile companion app. The Telegraph says that Apple is going to introduce AirPlay Direct next month, which will allow for Apple devices to talk to each other and other components like speakers without the need for a network. That sounds pretty reasonable considering the rumors that Apple's making its dock connector really tiny. AirPlay Direct, a working name, is expected to be announced at the as of unannounced iPhone event on September 12th. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by the new Squarespace.com. Faster and easier than ever if you want to create a high quality blog. From a user perspective, the new Squarespace gives you and your websites the best mobile experience. We've been talking about this all week. Develop new templates with mobile-ready designs. I've told you about how it can change your images into seven different versions so they look right on whatever screen it is. I've told you about the new templates. I hope I made it clear. Your site automatically restructures to any size device so it looks professionally designed. No matter how it's viewed, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is pick the template you like and, and create your site and pick the modules and say what photo galleries we want to show up, what Twitter feeds, where you want your posts, what, you, what style you want your headlines, what colors you want. Squarespace does the rest. I mean, if you want to get in there and tweak the HTML5 or, or the CSS3, you can uh, do that, but you don't have to. And it does it all automatically. Plus, the new drag and drop system is, is so much improved. It, it really is WYSIWYG. You can see what the page is going to look like right while you're editing it and all online and in apps don't take my word for it though go try it out yeah you don't even have to give them a credit card just go there right now no risk squarespace.com start a website or even import your old website see what it looks like in a squarespace template we think you're gonna like it and if you do uh try it with our code and get 10 percent off your first purchase on new squarespace accounts that's right if you decide to purchase the service use that offer code tnt8 uh, that'll get you 10% off either a monthly or an annual plan. Don't forget, with annual plans, you get a free domain name. So use that offer code TNT8. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. So IFA Berlin, uh, IFA is a, an electronics conference going on in Berlin, uh, capturing uh, some news this year. Sony had their press conference this morning. Uh, Kaz Hirai got up on stage. Very efficient. It was just Kaz, just talking about products. Uh, and he had some big products to announce. I think the one that's captured most of the headlines, the 84-inch 4K Bravia LCD TV. Uh, if you like the model names for televisions, I don't understand you, but it's XBR 84X900. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Two rolls X's right off there. the yeah. tongue. Well titled. Uh, upscales from any source, which is good because there's really no 4K content out there unless you make it yourself. Uh, it has Wi-Fi in it as well as an Ethernet connection. And uh, the best part is they won't give you a price, but they say it'll be available this holiday season. I'm guessing $10,000 or, or more. Have thing, you been right? good this year? How have good you have been you been nice? Yeah. Not have that you been good. 4K good? <laughs> if you've got to ask, you can't afford it. There's no way. Yeah. Uh, but, that, you know, we are moving into this next phase of televisions now. 3D, I think they've left 3D behind for the moment. That was their bridge yeah, right. Their bridge feature between 1080p and 4K, and they're, they're, we're starting to see them finally moving on. I think we're going to see a lot of 4K TVs at CES. Yeah, and as for 4K content, the thing is if you have, like a, I don't know, a 30-megapixel camera or something lower, you can see those images a lot clearer than you could before. So just because people don't have a bunch of 4K video cameras doesn't mean that they don't have... Uh, 4K content sitting around just with their old digital photos. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and there are more uh, uh, 4K devices being made. There's a, a 4K AV receiver out there now. There's some cameras that are less expensive than a RED camera out there now. Also, Sony announcing the Xperia line, tablets and phones. Uh, they, remember, they took over making phones from Ericsson. So Xperia T, Xperia V, and Xperia J were on display. These are Android phones with ice cream sandwich. They say they're going to upgrade them to Jelly Bean as soon as possible. That's what everybody says uh, when they put out their phones these days. Xperia T is the, the headliner, though. 4.6-inch display, 1080p HD video playback, 13-megapixel uh, camera, has near-field communication, so NFC chip in there. Uh, and the NFC chip works with other Sony headphones and speakers, so you just tap it. when you. They show this thing where you get home, you just tap it on the speaker, and then you start playing music right to your speakers when you're home. Yeah. I don't know. 
Uh, I don't well, want to have to tap. That's I saw. I saw you sent out a tweet this that morning. That was right then, that, right when I was watching. That, that pretty much said it's like people don't want to touch their phones to things, and yeah. I'm I'm with you on that. It's not that you have to. It's not like because it's going to break or anything. It it just. It seems a little cumbersome. I totally disagree. I, I, I despise Bluetooth pairing. I, I think that it should be a, some, something as simple as if these devices are physically close to each other mm -hmm. and you can actually touch them, if that makes the pairing work a lot better, that should be the standard. Instead of going, oh, what was the code for that keyboard? It was 973. Oh, it just refreshed. Oh, what happened? It lost it. Discoverable mode? Forget all of that. Like, just tap these two devices and they should work. Uh, the Xperia V was touted as an LTE phone that's water resistant, uh, so you could use it in the rain. You said use it rain or shine. They're kind of stretching for. for what uh, if you're an Olympic there. swimmer? Can you use it? I then? don't know if you could. You didn't say anything about just being resistant. You can yeah. be a coach outside, splash proof. <laughs> and the Xperia J is good looking, which means it's their bargain phone. Uh, these are nice looking phones, though. I, I have to admit. Yeah, they, they look great. Yeah, I think since Sony doesn't have to collaborate or work in a joint venture, they have a lot more control on the design, and they can have their version of Android work, I think they call it Media Scape, or I can't remember their actual skin, but I think they can tweak that enough to keep the experience uh, different. I uh, want to get through a few more. They had a ton of product announcements. The Xperia Tablet S is splash proof. They're really big about being water waterproof, apparently, at Sony these days. Uh, the nice beach. looking tablet, though. Tegra 3, infrared, so you can control your TV with it. They like to do that because they sell TVs. Uh, Android 4.0, uh, the Play Memory Storage Service, where you can store your photos, give you five gigabytes if you buy the tablet. Available September 7th, $400 for the 16 gig model, up to $600 for the 64 gig model. They also introduced a couple of Windows tablets. The Vio Duo 11, a surf slider hybrid PC with Windows 8. So the keyboard rests under the screen and can slide up to go from slate to keyboard. And also the Vio Tap 20, which is actually an all-in-one PC, uh, that they call a tabletop, has a hinge that lets it stand up or lay down. So I like what Sony did here. They said, regular old tablet like you're used to with an iPad, that's Android. That's our tablet S. It's part of the Xperia line. A, a tablet that's a hybrid or, or, or can, can do some convertible stuff, got a little more juice to it, that's a Vio. That's part of our Windows line. I think with Windows 8 and the new the new touch first interface, it seems like every every manufacturer of computers gets like a do over. And, and who can outstyle Microsoft at this point with the Surface? And I think Sony's got some pretty interesting designs there because it seems like for the most part you'll be using Windows 8 with that touch screen, but every now and then you want to use that keyboard. I think Asus is doing very similar things. Basically, uh, they're using like their transformer line as their model. The same kind of usage. I think there's there could be just you know HP and Dell should be shaking in their boots because if they can't outstyle Sony. Asus, they're going to be falling by the wayside. I can mention the cameras in the news views as well. The Sony NEX5R mirrorless 16.1 megapixel camera with Wi-Fi. Uh, and so that can integrate with Play Memories. You can add apps to it. You can you can offload uh, your photos right out of this camera. It's a nice camera. $650 for body only coming in October. Or if you want to get the uh, uh, the kit with the lens, $750. Still pretty reasonable. Considering, yeah, very reasonable. You know, uh, now, mirrorless and compact. Exactly. These, these are high-quality cameras here. And then the Action Cam, which is their GoPro competitor. <laughs> is, uh, it, is it splash resistant? <laughs> it is probably splash <laughs> resistant. <laughs> it's a wearable camera. It comes with Wi-Fi as well. So they're really pushing the Play Memories thing. Coming in late September, early October for $199.00. Or if you, that's without the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi version uh, costs you an extra 70 bucks for $270. It does not have an LCD screen. So you're probably going to want to plunk down for that 70 extra dollars to be able to uh, access it. Because if you have uh, a phone that can access it over Wi-Fi with the Sony app, which they have an app for Android and iOS, you can actually use the Play Memories app to, to interface with the camera, get stuff in, off of it. Uh, Sony MDR1 headphones, Music Unlimited acts their, uh, access, they're uh, adding a new... Uh, trial version, 60-day uh, free trial, as well as unlimited streaming tier for €4.99 a so month. So it's just it's like built into the headphones? You're not actually plugging them into a separate device? No, no, these are two service? separate things. I ran oh. them together. <laughs> okay. The headphones and the music unlimited. Like, that's pretty cool. Those are just the other things that they announced. <laughs> I see. Uh, uh, let's move on to the uh, sad, sad Sega. S Saga. Uh, not Sega. 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 It, it's it reminds like me of the sad story of Sega, Sega in a way, uh, of OnLive. Uh, and welcome in uh, Sean Hollister from The Verge. Uh, we dra dragged him out of the shower to be on the show this morning. Thanks for uh, for hurrying up for us, Sean. I appreciate that. You look great, Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm sporting a, a new giant headphone look. and My internet connection is terrible this morning, so if I completely drop out or get all choppy, you know why. 
Okay, Doug. Let, so far, so good. You guys had a great piece. Sean, you wrote this piece uh, about the, about uh, on on live. Lots of information saying that CEO Steve Perlman is to blame for the company's failure. Ultimately, uh, what what did you find out? Uh, well, uh, to long story short, we found out that uh, the company doing pretty well for itself. It had some some really really great ideas to bring games to uh, to people remotely through the through the internet through this streaming technology but ended up turning down a lot of deals because of a uh, vendetta that Steve Perlman had with his rival um, David Perry at a company called Gaikai which was trying to do a very similar thing and uh, he turned down deals from electronic arts and and uh, it's I, 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 it's very choppy over here am I, am I getting through you yeah yeah, yeah. you're fine Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, and, uh, and basically, it's, it's a tale of, that I got from uh, lots of anonymous employees, uh, ex-employees, who uh, who got laid off uh, when the when the company said, you know, we we, we can't afford uh, all the servers we've got here. We can't afford to to do this with this few users. But it's something that the company knew for a long time. There was this this critical problem that the company, that under Steve Perlman didn't bother to solve. Instead, they kept looking for more funding, for buyouts, by continually innovating and trying to bring out different angles on the same technology to get somebody to pick up the company or, or to put that investment into the company to allow them to keep running without solving this critical problem. Now, Sean, in, in the article, you also mentioned that apparently Valve approached uh, uh, approached on live, but apparently Steve Perlman scared them off with a really broad offer. Could you expand on that? Because it se seemed like a really interesting uh, marriage that could have been great if Valve was working with on live. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can't say who approached who, but they did set up a meeting of Valve and and on live, and they ended up talking about doing this on a on, you know originally it was going to be on a um, on a very. Uh, a very a very small basis at first they were going to be maybe perhaps bringing on a couple of games seeing how it worked is what i was told but i heard that steve perlman ended up pitching a you know a vast plan to tie the companies together to be possibly um valve's streaming component such that uh, all of that you know, could get all of valve's games this way steam could become a streaming service instead of a digital download service and these grand plans I hear, are what scared Valve away. There were also some really great, uh, interesting tidbits in that article as well, with HP looking to acquire online's desktop platform. Uh, how did that fall apart? Well, I've heard a couple different stories about how that fell apart, and it's it's hard to say for sure without talking to Steve Perlbit or, or somebody uh, deep in at HP. But uh, I, the two stories that I've heard are that HP took a look at online's financials and they saw that the company wasn't making money and didn't want to deal with that. They weren't interested in bringing on that kind of an expense. Uh, the other thing I heard was simply that HP decided it wasn't in a merger and acquisition phase anymore. It, its financials were not doing so well and that it simply said, you know, we'd love to do this, but we can't do it right now. So how did the employees convince the, uh, the new owners, Lauder Partners, to get rid of Steve Perlman and then hire somebody else? I mean, that seems like quite the coup since Perlman did start That's the company. That's a great question. I, I've been trying to get the answer to that recently, and uh, I've heard from I heard from several employees. Uh, actually, the first day that they came back to work, Steve was there. Some of the uh, original executives from the company were there, explaining how the new company would run under Lauder Partners, which who is which is the, uh, the the investor that bought all the assets from the original company. The new owner, basically, is Lauder Partners. Uh, Steve and so on were there, talking up the same thing that they'd been. The, you know the same plans, the same the same lack of long term plans about how to turn how to turn the company around, and employees, uh, even the ones who were you know who who really really needed a job, they were not so sure they wanted to get on board with that anymore. So I understand that a group of them decided to get together and and you know and, and tell Lauder in uh, in no uncertain terms that they were not willing to come back and work under Steve Perlman again. Um, I don't have details beyond that, really, except that it seems that they managed to convince him one way or another to to let Perlman go, or, or, or Perlman got convinced that uh, he just wasn't wanted there.
Sean, that's, it's an absolutely fascinating read. If you check it out, The Verge, you guys, if you haven't read this whole thing, there's so many other things in this article, uh, like with, with Ubisoft and Perlman basically screaming at people left and right, micromanagement, just a fascinating investigative journalism, Sean. Uh, where else can people find your, your uh, information? Or are you working on any other investigative uh, pieces? Because I'd like to know. I, I haven't worked on any uh, any tremendous investigative pieces in the past. I I, I do um, I, I like to uh, follow the streaming game space in particular. I'm very interested in what uh, Sony is doing with Gaikai now, for instance. I'm I'm interested in uh, GameStop and Spawn Labs, and I have a, a report about uh, the GameStop factory actually and what the company believes that they're going to do with Spawn Labs, which is also a streaming game service that may or may not have a feasible business model and that's owned by GameStop so you know obviously big game retailer there with a lot of interest in having such a service um, but they're not sure what to do with it yet um, right now I'm I'm continuing to talk to on live employees I'm I'm hoping to find out a little bit more about where the company is going from here very cool Sean Alistair from the first thanks for joining us uh, on such short notice thanks for having me thanks again Sean really appreciate it all right, let's move on to uh, an interesting story at the New York Times today about a digital music option a lot of people probably don't know about. Yeah, uh, this is called Move, uh, M-U-V-E. Uh, it's a phone-based music plan that's sold through Cr Cricket Wireless. Uh, if you're a Cricket Wireless customer, maybe you, know, you do know about it, but it was news to me. It's unlimited song downloads for $10 per month. Now, when I first read the New York Times article, I said, oh, that must be a typo. It's unlimited streaming music. It's not actually downloads. But it is indeed downloads uh, onto your phone. And it's bundled into, if you're already a quick Cricket Wireless customer, your monthly phone bill, which would range, depending on which phone that you use to bundle the service into, $55 to $65 per month. Well, uh, for, you know, anybody who's on prepaid plans, um, you know, that that's probably sounds just about right. But to me, it's probably about half of what I'm paying. So the deal is, is that uh, the folks at Cricket say our demographic is young. Uh, they often live in urban areas. Their phone is their main computer. Uh, they're middle to low uh, uh, as far as the income bracket would be. Average $35,000 per year. Many of them lack credit cards. So that's why they prefer Cricket's month-to-month -month cash plan. But they're not necessarily people who want to be getting music for free when they could pay something that is uh, convenient and not unreasonable as far as the price goes. So the idea is, is that Cricket's a subsidiary of Leap Wireless, of course. They've got 6 million subscribers. And since January 2011, Move and Cricket have signed up 600,000 users to get music service that's just bundled into their Cricket wireless service that they're already paying. Now, obviously, uh, depending on what kind of phone you have, if, you know, if, you've, if you've got a smartphone, you have other options for streaming music. Uh, streaming music and downloading, obviously, are, are two different things. But as far as having access to a lot of stuff and discovery, the pricing, $10 a month-ish, which was, it was kind of like the move portion of what you'd already be paying to Cricket, is about on par with what you would be getting other places, but you don't have to think about it. This is actually just part of your wireless plan that you would already be paying for. In fact, I went ahead and went to um, to move uh, music. I think it's movemusic.com, and they said, "What's your zip code? Let's figure out what kind of phone you would be offered." Because depending on where you are is depending on what kind of phone you're offered. I put in my zip code. I got a plan with a Huawei Mercury phone. It's a Android phone running Gingerbread. Uh, the phone is 199 out of the gate, so that's a flat fee. Plus, my move plan was $55. Um, and within that plan, it's unlimited song downloads and then a lot of bells and whistles like ring back tones, 100 U.S. minutes, U.S. minutes, um, it, which is for some people, that's fine. For no other international people. calling. Exactly. Yeah. Unlimited texting, unlimited pictures and unlimited video. Now, Move doesn't uh, really, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the fine print is on unlimited video. But today, the company is entering a new line of phones. Right now, they've had a, a limited number of phones. Um, they are wanting to go into the more smartphone arena. Some of the phones are clearly feature phones. But then their monthly plans may go up a little bit. And something like, uh, I'm sorry, wh when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about Cricket Wireless's plans. Something like Move might be $10 on top of a more expensive plan. But again... This is that prepaid uh, market uh, that a lot of people like. It not only can be easier, uh, especially if you don't have things like credit or 
or that sort of thing. You save a little bit of money. But I like the idea of this. I'm saying, this is so easy. It's $10 a month. Do you want unlimited music? A lot of people are saying yes. And I, I saw a paid content, I think it was paid content article earlier today about how the music industry is quietly realizing that Spotify is doing them a lot of good. Mm -hmm. They're making a lot of money off people that they weren't making money off of before because of the free option. So we're finally getting around to the music industry catching up to the idea that, hey, you give people good options and they will use them. And this this is another great option. Exactly. As far as music licensing deal, because obviously that has to be part of this, um, we don't know exactly the details of what portion of that $10 monthly fee goes toward royalties back to the record companies. But that is what's going on. Uh, supposedly, the record companies, um, depending on how many downloads uh, came from each company, gets divvied up at the end of the month. Um, some analysts say it's probably 3 to $5 of that 10 So they're getting money back. They're not getting iTunes-level money, but they're getting money that iTunes, they weren't getting, getting before. They're not getting iTunes-level percentage, but as more and more of these things catch exactly. on, they're going to start getting a lot of money and it, it's mounting all the time the, the the controversy is how much the artists are getting out of it that, that's that's usually where the the fight comes also from. i mean how much is move going to grow they signed up five hundred thousand users in their first year that was last year this year they've signed up i mean we're only halfway through the year but uh, about a hundred thousand so so growth is either slowing or not enough people know about it but you know, it remains to be seen if this is going to actually be a Spotify competitor, which has a lot more, a lot more customers worldwide. And it's actually a really good way to differentiate Cricket from all the other smaller wireless carriers out there because they have this service. I believe uh, it's rumored that Radio Shack is going to be offering their own phones or their branded service through Cricket, which would include the Move service. It seems like if you can't compete on the network scale, why not compete with features? And if you can have this low-cost device and a low-cost plan and you get music on top of that, uh, that seems like a really good deal. Although, this kind of thing has failed before. I think like Nokia would include music with their phones, and that didn't really take off. But if you do it on the carrier level, when it comes to the billing, it's a lot easier. So I think I think this kind of uh, situation is just very advantageous for something like Cricket. I, yeah, I, and, and I think, you know, Move I've, I've heard of before. They've been around for a while, but they've been trying to find their niche. So I think this is a good one to partner up with someone else who's kind of an underdog like Cricket. Uh, and 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 team up and and use your mutual strengths to the best advantage. I wonder what you can do when you've got all these files on your phone. Then what? Like unlimited downloads. I mean, it's obviously designed not to leave your phone, and it's designed for people who use their phone as their primary computer. So maybe don't need to or care to start some sort of a storage base somewhere else on a big hard drive. I wonder if Cricket makes any profit margins, some special Cricket branded SD cards or anything. Let's say, you know, high margin kind of devices like this. Oh, look, if you want to have cloud storage with us or you want to have, yeah. I mean, this could move into that, well, yeah. no pun intended, you can move into that kind of field because you have <laughs> this, this ability to download all the time. And also there's caps, don't forget the bandwidth caps. So it's kind of an interesting idea that your wireless company- That's why when it, said, when it said unlimited video in my potential plan, I was like, what's that mean exactly? Video is limited. I've heard, of, I've heard of that before. Yeah. It's called stuttering. Yeah, they're essentially realizing, like, you know, saying we'll give you unlimited downloads doesn't mean that you'll ha you'll be able to make use of it because of those kinds of limitations. Exactly. All right, let's uh, talk about the uh, Wi-Fi Direct uh, protocol, which is uh, one of the protocols out there trying to make it easier for devices to talk directly to each other without going over a network. Sounds like Apple may be on board for yeah, this. Yeah, AirPlay Direct is the rumor from the Telegraph citing sources close to the matter or something similar like that. Obviously, currently, AirPlay requires a network to have devices talk to each other. And this is going to compete with standards like Miracast, which uh, I think we talked about back in July, which, which does video streaming without the router, piggybacks on Wi-Fi Direct, and it's currently in development at the Wi-Fi Alliance, which means it could take, I don't know how long for it to actually be ratified. Uh, how difficult is it right now to get your devices to talk to each other? I, I know, Sarah, you have an Apple TV. I have an Apple yes. TV. And you have to have these devices all chained on a network. Do you find this to be troublesome? Or like, if, is, is something like AirPlay Direct that seems like something that would be a lot easier to use? Well, I mean, <clears throat> my music is on Apple products to start off with. So it is not hard for me to stream something like music through my Apple TV. If I didn't have my Apple TV, well, I just bought a receiver that will allow for AirPlay. I mean, it's, they call it AirPlay. It basically works like AirPlay streaming. So it'll stream through my receiver and I'll be able to play my music on my speakers. And that's something that I can do via AirPlay. But 
Yeah, I don't have any other devices that aren't actually attached to that one master network as far as speakers go. Like but I, was, I would like to be able to airplay too. I was trying to set up, you know, the whole uh, whole home audio, different zones and everything. And you have to have these little receivers. I have to buy special speakers that have Wi-Fi components built in. And then you have to put in your passcode or you hope you have Ethernet in that area. I find that to be a little cumbersome when you're trying to do that, especially if you're in an apartment. Unless you want to wire everything, it might not be uh, that that interesting. It just, to me, it seems like Apple's got a huge advantage. I know people are very upset about the idea that this is not open. Right? They're not using the Wi-Fi direct, uh, the, the open version of that. They are using their own version. In theory, this is still a rumor, by the way. Uh, but the thing is, Apple seems to have an advantage, again, when it comes to its proprietary solutions, like AirPlay, because things like the Wi-Fi Alliance take a really long time for things to, to, to get pushed through. And before you know it, people are like, oh, does that, does that uh, Nexus do AirPlay? They start saying things like that, because that becomes the generic term, not DLNA, not Wi-Fi Direct or Miracast. Apple seems to be able to move a lot faster because they don't have to like they don't have to please an alliance at all yeah I, I think it's it's funny people start getting upset at apple before they've even actually done anything uh, because of what they assume they're going to do i am encouraged by this because i think that the idea of getting uh devices to talk to each other is important getting that that direct connection is actually a way around using your bandwidth uh, it's 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 a way to conserve and say you know let's let's make the edge even closer let's have the laptop talk directly to 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 the phone why send it out on the internet and have it bounce back if we're trying to you know if if the carriers really do have a bandwidth problem let's let's get around that let's let's use our ability to connect directly because I think that's a Trojan horse and I'm talking way down the line here to mesh networking which gets rid of a mediator whatsoever why send our traffic to anyone at all unless we absolutely have to there will always be a need for a backbone network there will always be a need for backhaul but there isn't necessarily a need for the cable company or traditional DSL ISP if we can get all the devices talking to each other and passing internet traffic if each one of our devices were a freaking access point that could pass traffic through securely, which is a bit a tall order, but it's possible. Uh, it would change the entire debate about how the internet is used. And I, and I think this is a grant, very tippy tip top of the iceberg, but this is the kind of technology that needs to be developed for that. Yeah, and the other thing is like, if you have, I'm, I'm kind of curious how the pairing is gonna work. I mean, if it's Apple, it's usually pretty easy because you go AirPlay to that device, assuming it's on the same network. But I'm not really sure how this would work apart from, I guess, like having a code or something. But I, I know that physical distance, even within a home network, can cause AirPlay issues. So if you're like, my Apple TV is like five feet from me, why can't this play properly because my router's in the other room? It seems like it'll solve a lot of those problems. And that seems like that's like Apple's MO. They try to make things as easy as possible to move that music around in your house. I, I think this is probably gonna happen, especially with that rumor of that dock is gonna get smaller. So if, that's, if they're gonna say AirPlay is a solution, and now we have AirPlay Direct. All right, let's move on to Google and uh, moving Google Plus into a new arena. The debate's still going on about how popular Google Plus is and what it's actually being used for. But Google would like businesses to use it. Yeah, Google Plus is definitely still being shoved into the Google experience. Google is all in as far as Google Plus goes. The uh, most recent news is that... Uh, Google Plus for Enterprise started last October where you could use your Google Apps accounts to get on Google Plus. Today, there's something called a full preview of Google Plus for Google Apps accounts, which is stuff like restricted sharing options. So if we're all on the Twit Google Plus network and I share something with Ayaz and Tom, they don't have the option to share outside of this. It's it's a it's a closed sharing um, for, you know, stuff that's that's company based. Also video meetings that are integrated with other Google products like Gmail or Calendar or Docs. So when we're all in our Tech News Today doc in the morning, for example, we can fire up um, you know, basically like a hangout, but again, it doesn't work the way that it does with public hangouts. Additional administration, administrative controls, um, and so on. And it's kind of like uh, the folks at Google Plus say, remember where Gmail, Gmail launched, it was a personal thing, you know, it's your personal email account. And then as time went on, we figured out ways to roll Gmail into actual business needs. So a lot of people use Gmail with Google Apps um, for enterprise. Now, this is going to be free until the end of 2013. If this is like, wow, this sounds like something that my business can use, Google is implying that eventually they're going to charge for these extra collaboration tools, um, like how it charges for online productivity tools right now. So Gmail and Calendar and Docs and Google Plus, 
for the for the time being, it's certainly worth trying out uh, if this is interesting to you. So, but that's not all that Google Plus is doing. Um, this is kind of, it's, it's a move that, I don't know, sounds more like Facebook than anything. We talked yesterday about Nexus 7 ads being on Google.com, the homepage, and how we all felt about that. Google.com is now going to display the birthdays of people that you have in your Google Plus circles, provided that they enter their birthdays and those birthdays are correct. And if you want other people to be able to see when your birthday is, when they hit Google.com, you can control that in your Google Plus settings. You know, make sure that you know only certain circles have that sort of information from you. Now, I went to Google.com and I can't find any birthday information. Maybe it's just because none of my uh, contacts in Google Plus have a birthday today. But I guess that's possible. Although, you know, it's Natalie Morris's birthday today, and I'm pretty sure she's I think that Google was yesterday. Plus. Oh, that was yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aha. Okay, good to know, because I was thinking about that. Um, so that's just one more thing that's going to muck up that beautiful white screen at Google.com. Again, it's not something that I use all that often. Although, this is kind of funny. All Things D dug up a great quote from Marissa Meyer when we were talking about, hey, when she was in charge, you would have never seen that Nexus 7 ad, even though there was no Nexus 7. Uh, but there's a great quote from her back in December 2005. Uh, she says, there will be no banner ads on the Google homepage or web search results pages. There will not be crazy, flashy, graphical doodads flying and popping up all over the Google site ever till she left. Yeah. Right. And now that, you know, all bets are off. Ever is a long time. What's weird is that, uh, at least as far as I can see, okay, so your Google Plus uh, friends will dictate whose birthdays will show up on your Google.com experience. But you can't get that information within Google Plus. It's only at Google.com, which I don't go to. Well, so I, what the heck? I wonder if these two things aren't unrelated. I mean, the thing is, if you have a business setting and you want to have, like, these little push notifications showing up on people's Google.com page, the fact that it can be a birthday is one thing. But if there's a meeting coming up, maybe it'll show up on everybody's homepage. Because it seems like Google's just saying, look, just get a browser. We don't care what operating system you're using. Just use our services. You'll know everything with, with this uh, social network. And the other thing with Google+, Plus in this context, isn't necessarily a social network. It's a collaborative tool, right? Yeah. That's really what you're doing. Like, if we were talking about a story discussion, we could do that in, in a thread there, or we could do that in docs, do a hangout right away to you know hammer out some things. So it seems like... Uh, it's almost like a Salesforce competitor. As Google moves forward, I'm starting to feel like, huh, you know, they people see Google as a tool, right? And they've got all these... <laughs> more and more every day. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it's like, as far as putting Google Plus up to Facebook, people say, well, everyone's on Facebook and none of people are on Google Plus. Now, you may be on Google Plus and you don't agree, but that's the argument that I hear a lot. But Google really, I mean, their whole, their... their their suite of uh, enterprise docs, I mean, we use them every day. I mean, I, I find them indispensable. So I think that that's smart of them to spin it in this way. Yeah. All right, let's finish up uh, with the Samsung Unpacked event going on at IFA Berlin right now as we're recording the show. Uh, and they've made a couple of good announcements here. First of all, Samsung Galaxy Note 2, as we knew, as we expected, uh, looks very similar to the Galaxy S3 it's uh, slightly narrower, slightly taller than the current Galaxy Note. 1.6 gigahertz quad-core processor, 2 gig of RAM, uh, Android 4.1. This is going to come with Jelly Bean in October to as 128 countries. Huh? I said as it should. Yeah. Well, we, we didn't get that from the Xperia line, right? So That's, this is yeah, Samsung kind of one-upped them there. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's lots of little silent digs at Apple through this whole thing. I'm oh, not going to sure. even bother to, to mention. Uh, 3,100 uh, milliamp hour battery in here, so it's a nice big battery. But I think the thing that's sh deservedly getting the most attention is the S Pen. Uh, they have a new way of detecting the pen. Now, I think it's the stupidest name in the world. It's a freaking stylus. But you hold it 10 millimeters above the surface and you can actually get previews of things like uh, little preview videos uh, recognize and launch on-screen items like pictures inside an album are what, so it's sort of like a hover there. with a mouse yeah so type a thing? click means one thing but if you just get it real close it'll just like pop up like oh do you want to look oh, at this picture a little bit um they're doing a lot of interesting uh, things. There's a pop-up play feature, plays local video and a little window overlay. Uh, we've seen that on the Galaxy S3, uh, but but that's in there as well. And uh, they're, they're going through the stylus stuff right now on, on S -pen, stage. S-Pen, Tom. I'm sorry, the Spen on stage right <laughs> now. Uh, they haven't quite gotten to the Windows Phone ATIVS, but that has been officially announced by Microsoft. 4.8-inch AMOLED screen. 
1.5 gigahertz processor, 8 megapixel rear cam, and uh, coming in 16 gig or 32 gig models, both of which have a micro SD slot and a 2300 milliamp hour battery. This is kind of the Galaxy S3 for Windows Phone. Yeah, with, with the changes to Windows Phone 8, companies like Samsung can put together some really impressive hardware to run that software. And it looks like Samsung, they already, they know how to make these devices. They make it with the uh, their Android phones. Why not give that to Microsoft? And so when this happens, when this thing launches sometime in October or December, I think it's going to be, you know, it's going it's to be a pretty big hit potentially. I'm really interested in, in the Galaxy Note 2. I was looking at that again, and it's, it's, it's the resolution is the same, but they got rid of that pentile display. So if you if you can't unsee that horrible display, you don't have to worry about it with this one. So uh, I, I think Samsung's got some really interesting devices out there. And I think they're also working on some Windows 8 tablets too. They're really uh, trying to push the idea that nobody else does the Note. And I think part of that they were already going to do. Part of that is a little bit in reaction to the Apple Samsung patent case. Uh, but I think they've got a point. They, they, you're using the word phablet, Sarah. I'm sorry. Uh, Don't but, be sorry. That's uh, what it is. But they are, they are saying like, hey, there is a place between your smartphone and your tablet that nobody's filling, and we're filling it. And now we're making it even better with the Galaxy Note 2. I, I think this is, uh, this is something to keep an eye on. And, of course, uh, as, as they get to more details about the ATVS, the Windows phone, we'll pay more attention to that as well. I think the only people who are like, tablet, meh, weird size, it's like, are the people who don't have one? I'm not saying that if I had one, then I'd, I'd all of a sudden think that it was the best size. But I don't hear a lot of people saying, you know, I thought the Note was going to be great, but it's too odd. They like the size. This is a need. People want this. Yeah, I was looking at the the resolution is still twelve eighty by seven twenty. Like if you're gonna have this large physical display, it'd be nicer if you could cram more pixels in there so you can get more information yeah. at a time. Because that's where I find the, the the line between tablets and and phones is how much information can I get up at one time. And the more resolution I get, the better it is. And that's why like twelve eighty by seven twenty is pretty good. Uh, but that's not an improvement from the last note. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's a, it's it's still somewhat of a phone. <laughs> well, and, and it is. I think that they're not trying to say it isn't. Uh, it, I want a mini tablet. Uh, well, then go get that Galaxy Player. The five point, mm -hmm. It's even 5 bigger, 5.8 8. 8 inches. I got to check the resolution on that, too. Yeah. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Oh, the viral, I don't know if it's a video. I guess it's a video, but you can also play with the guy's muscles. Uh, Terry Crews <laughs> for Old Spice. Burning up the internet right now. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a video. It starts off with a video of him. Uh, doing a one-man band sort of thing by flexing his muscles. He's got electrodes attached, and it makes drums go and keyboards play, and there's a fire sax, and it's pretty pretty hilarious. Uh, and then afterwards, as you would expect, you are then able to control his muscles yourself by clicking on them. <laughs> and there's also I mean, it's kind of genius. There's I also say. a fire sax coming up too. If you're if you're into that, I think that speaks for itself. He's a good muscle control. flexor. That is some some precise control. Yeah. Now wait a minute. So don't they? Yeah. I'm wondering about this. They have those uh, those things that you can hook up to your body that will force your, the muscle that it's connected to to flex. Oh, is it I, wonder uh, if the, I wonder if the instruments are actually triggering his muscles. I you don't could know. Also, you could also you know edit I mean? this cleverly to, oh, of in course four you quadrants could. Of course so you that could. he wouldn't have to do it all exactly live. Yeah. Do it! <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Oh, man. It's, uh, it's pretty it's just, awesome. It's just though, sort of video when it, when it starts, you're like, this is going to be dumb. It yeah. gets better. And then you can't help but love it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's, it's tearing up the internet. All right, let's see what's on the calendar. Uh, Nokia's teasing its September 5th event says... Things are about to change. Well, I think that that's for sure, Nokia. Just to, it's on you uh, how they're going to change for the better or worse. Motorola's Intel phone is set for a September 18th launch. TomTom Tom is bringing a navigation app to Android in October. We don't have that many details yet, but we do have a date. And two mapping cars were behind adjacent motels on the east side of Regina, Saskatchewan this evening. This is an email from Mark, by the way. I knew about Google Street Maps, but I had not heard that TomTom Tom is out doing the same thing. I've never seen a TomTom Tom car GPS unit that did street views. Is this something coming soon for them? It was interesting that the two cars were in behind adjacent motels. 
yeah, uh, that is interesting. So TomTom Tom bringing an app to Android and competing with Google on Street View. That's pretty intriguing. Motel views. <laughs> in, in room. In Canada. Yeah. Let's just see what's incoming. Incoming message. <laughs> Got a call from Ottawa uh, about the death of the start menu. Oh, I was a little behind on that. Here you go. Hey, Tom. Ed calling from Ottawa, Canada. Just listening to the, today's episode of Tech News Today, and I'm laughing in the car about you guys talking about the death of the start menu. I remember when ni Windows 95 was originally launched, and everybody was trying to figure out how to get Program Manager back. I don't think the loss of the start button is necessarily a bad thing. Thanks for thanks for the show. Have a great week. Bye. I was one of those people. I was going to ask, was was anybody actually lamenting the loss of Program Manager? I, yeah. That was you? I hated the start menu. <laughs> Absolutely hated it. But you it. want it back. Did you well, hate I'm used it? to it now. Did you hate <laughs> it because it was confusing or just you thought that it was like a dumbing down of a... I, of a process I was used you were to program used to. manager in Windows 3.1, and now I had to go to this stupid start menu, which didn't even start things half the time. I was going to there to shut down, didn't make any gall gall darn sense. I liked my little program manager. I knew where to go to click the things that I wanted to click in it. And in fact, I figured out how to restore it because it was still there in Windows 95, and you could use program manager in Windows 95. And I actually shed a little tear when it went away. I think the only thing I missed from 3.1 is file manager. Explorer, I don't like, but everything else, eh. Now, granted... In the intervening 17 years, <laughs> I have gotten used to the start menu. And now they want to take that away. Nothing lasts. Start menu never bothered me, but I did hack it to say meow. So it was oh, yeah. my meow I menu. remember when we did that on the screen saver. Yeah. <laughs> That was my contribution. Yeah. Uh, we got an email from Chris G who said, I'm writing a response to the story about EasyPay. I had something similar happen to me. I'm totally blind and I use voiceover on my iPhone. I also use an app called Taxi Magic that allows you to pay for cab rides by using your phone. Well, I was taking a cab somewhere and when we arrived at the destination, I asked him what the fare was. I proceeded to pay him. The transaction went through. I even heard his device in the front of the cab announce that the payment and amount was received. When I asked him to point me in the direction of the door, he asked if I needed to go in to get cash to pay him. I had to explain to him that the transaction went through. Maybe he just had a bad day, but it does go to show that these things do happen. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's hope that he wasn't trying to cheat you out of your fare. We got a couple emails about that uh, randomizer we did the other day about scanning your brain with that, uh, that helmet-like thing. Uh, email from George, the IT medical professional, uh, discussing how at NPR the announcer discussed whether people can learn in their sleep and turns out that you can. Researchers paired smell with sound. So in theory, you could, you could go this w one step further, uh, play the sound of a beeping ATM keypad, and a subject will think about their PIN code, and uh, there you can get information. And another email from... I don't know if I call that learning. It's more associating. I have to read that story. Though. And then an email from Simon in Liverpool, who talked about actually testing out one of these uh, one of these devices, and he says that it's one of the future possibilities, the researchers explained, might be to embed sensors permanently under the scalp or even inside the skull itself, and then having a wireless, li wireless link to outside devices, this would be aesthetically nicer. So there's an interesting future. So no more helmets just in your brain. I, well, on your head. No, I'm, I'm into that. I don't, I don't want to have to wear a helmet. Unless, you know, unless it's an unsafe area. Yeah, it could, you know, Hard hat area, I'll wear it. Interfere with your bicycle helmet. You yeah. want to make sure it's all neat. That's it for this episode of uh, Tech News Today. Thanks, everybody, for submitting stories for coverage in our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Place to go if you want to let us know what kinds of things uh, you would like us to talk about. You know, I, I was interested in that YubiKey NFC token for Android smartphones. So that's not new. That's been around since March. So I'm curious why that's getting, I mean, it was written up uh, as a feature on uh, the H online site today, H security, but, um, and, and it is pretty cool. It's the kind of thing that might be good for like a know-how or before mm -hmm. you buy sort of uh, situation, but but it's always good to get submissions in there. So go there, technewstoday.reddit.com. Uh, we are going to be back again tomorrow without me. I'll be off to DragonCon, but Iaz and Sarah and Jason will all be here. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email me, TNT at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Oh, Chris Knoll will be with us tomorrow mm. as well. They'll see you then.